to record. And welcome everyone, it's time to start. We'd like to start on time, thanks very much. This is a Jenkins online meetup. Today we have the privilege of having the T-Mobile development team present to us on POET, their pipeline system that they use to deploy to thousands of developers at T-Mobile. So Martin, would you like to take it up to lead us off first? We'll let you and Ravi go back and forth. Yeah, sounds good. Thank you, Mark. Uh, so just everybody, and we'll just uh, introduce ourselves here. What we're going to do today is we'll go through also just talking about what the vision and approach we had for this uh, pipeline and our strategy, uh, what motivated us to uh, end up where we were. And then uh, Ravi and Larry will take you through some of the high-level design and the implementation, then get down to kind of the core of the engine. It's uh, so it's kind of those three areas of just here's here's what led us to this point where uh, I was feeling motivated to uh, adjust and put things into uh, how do things a little differently than how pipelines were traditionally being viewed uh, at T-Mobile here. And then Ravi really was a key person for helping us uh, drive adoption and working with our teams at the time. Uh, he's now, you'll see a manager title. Uh, he just had that role uh, just a few weeks ago in another team. He got that uh, opportunity which is great uh, but really with the focus on working with our customers and understanding what their needs were so that kind of helped feeding our product pipeline as we continued and then Larry really was the guy at the heart of the engine who spent a lot of time putting the, the core parts of our engine together from which then everybody else was uh, leveraging it so as noted uh, I'm Martin Krinke senior manager of product and technology at T-Mobile uh, Ravi Sharma, uh, he also, as I noticed, he is now manager of product and technology at T-Mobile uh, in uh, one of our other pipeline teams, uh, but uh, he was the head of all of our, pro he was basically product manager, as I called it, product manager for customer support. It was so important how we looked at customer uh, support and how we talked about our customers and viewed our customers and listened to them that actually we had two product managers, one for the heart of the pipeline activities and then also uh, somebody just focused on customer and we found that paid off quite well. And Larry, as I mentioned, was really our guy for, you wanted something technical built, I go to Larry on, on that. So uh, Larry was definitely will be the guy under the covers that did a lot of the core work. All right, so really the, Kind of where all this came about was when we talk about managing a CICD pipeline, there can be a lot of complexities, right? Just building and designing that thing. And especially if uh, you work from a Jenkins perspective, right? You have all your plugins you've got to get. If you're on VMs, you're keeping those things going. You got to get them updated. You've got a variety of types of deployments people want to do. They want to start doing blue green, especially we start moving DevOps away. We want canary deployments. There's a lot of other workflows that you need to integrate. So all of a sudden you start doing more and more of this and your pipelines start becoming more and more customized, right? And operationally, you want to make sure everything's up and running. And you are, what if I need, should I be running five pipeline, five pipeline engines over there? You know, five Jenkins masters and people are working off of that. Uh, or do I, do I have one massive centralized one? Because then all that means I have fewer people maybe, or I don't have to be spread out in what my focus is. And then from a customer support perspective, uh, you know, you just had all these other things, which I will say a lot of times the customer support is overlooked a lot of times. And as a shared service organization, uh, it's often, you know, as much as we, Think about the things that we've got to do to provide tooling. Are you really thinking about your customer? And then, of course, if you're 24-7, how are you going to handle that? Do we have sufficient documentation? How are we training people? All those um, important, and at least our experiences here at T-Mobile had been that, you know, especially if somebody was trying to build more of a centralized one or a capability that other teams could use, this, this category was really lacking. And if it's lacking, boy, everything else kind of tends to suffer and frustrations mount uh, around. And it just becomes a challenge for everybody, whether it be the users of the platform, the people creating the platform, and then management's trying to make sense of do they continue with what they're doing or to go a different route. So this was kind of, kind of an overview of different types of things that uh, I was noticing and we certainly were dealing with in the work that we were doing within the teams we were supporting at the time. All right, so some of the key uh, visions on the, the POET pipeline. So POET actually, our team was, is the uh, pipelines, operations, environments, uh, and, and technology or tooling uh, tools. We're a shared service organization that works a lot around either SRE type functions, system reliability, engineering, uh, other things to do to help streamline a lot of the applications development 
uh, and practices for teams maybe that were in, in our front line. You think about that in our retail stores or our care. These would be the folks when you call in and need some customer support, things like that. So those are our primary focus, but then we also go beyond that and help other teams as uh, appropriate and as, as requested. And so as we're looking at this, we really wanted to streamline the development uh, pipelines uh, to using containers. The idea here that rather than writing lots of different custom codes and all that, let's create a library of containers, uh, Docker containers that can provide and execute a variety of things. And we'll have some examples for you of this um, coming up. And another goal here was developers like to have their flexibility, right? You want to give them the engineer, he's, but I got this other thing. There's always a reason, hey, I can't quite do that because I need to do this one other thing and you don't have that for me. So we really wanted to try to give them the flexibility uh, and adapt to the model that they were using uh, in their development. So not be too prescriptive. We really wanted to avoid that. It's usually a downfall of a lot of uh, shared service solutions and things is when you start being so prescriptive that people just feel they don't have that flexibility. And then again, a key thing here is let them focus more on the development and testing aspects of whatever it is they're building of their software rather than spending time on having to maintain their pipelines. Uh, this was an interesting, this just came up recently, but our senior vice president uh, made a comment recently that everybody was wanting to show their pipeline. He says, I talked to anybody, he goes, oh, you got to see our pipeline. And, you know, like, and he's like, I just, I don't know why. And well, one of the things I was, I talked about was, you know, why have they been wanting to show their pipelines to them? And it's really because they were complex. They're very proud of them. They spent a lot of time working on those pipelines. And so they're like, hey, we want to show you this because this is really cool. But our take was pipeline should not be that big a deal. It should be just, oh yeah, I have a pipeline. We run our stuff. We can deploy it. We build all the things we need. It's a piece of cake. It should not be that big a deal. And so this is really where we at T-Mobile have started to shift. Um, Poet Pipeline and some other activities have been happening. I've really been trying to move away from this uh, idea that every team is having to create their own pipelines because it's not efficient for the senior, senior VP. He has, I don't remember, thousands of people under him. It's not economical really for him if every team is building their own pipeline and trying to do all the custom work. So, uh, so one of the other things here that we uh, then want to do is let's set some principles for how we're going to work on this. Um, and we do it for both of our team. We have guiding principles for the team and how we work as a team, but also then what are we going to, what are our guiding principles that we're going to check ourselves against as we did this pipeline and, and built this out. And first of all, it was like, look, let's make it easier to implement new capabilities. Uh, we don't want to really have an impact to other users. And what does that mean? Well, if I go and I write, all new code in my engine, you know, I've got everybody's including in a Jenkins file and they're running this code and all that. And then I make changes to that library. I do a bunch of stuff. I could be impacting those folks. They start loading that one in and, you know, there's a lot of other testing that has to happen. If I'm upgrading plugins, do I know all the plugins work? Uh, I had uh, one person told me that he had uh, come into a company and they had over a hundred plugins running in their Jenkins instance. Well, you know, version to version, right? Those plugins can change. And we had a pipeline, not us, our team specifically, but here at T-Mobile, there was a pipeline that was trying to do more of the global, uh, hey, all you folks can come and use our pipeline. And they literally were taking two months to migrate from one version to the next. So that's not really getting to what we're trying to do when we want DevOps and continuous delivery. And, you know, whether it be for my app or my actual platform that I'm giving you, that platform needs to be able to go under those types of uh, uh, methods as well. So that was a challenge uh, that we we were very concerned about. We wanted to make sure that when people come in, we want to get somebody onto the pipeline. We want to help you. We want to make the usage and the onboarding faster and easier. We're going to be really conscious. So again, it gets about that customer, right? So let's think about our scalability, our reusability, our flexibility for the dev teams. Hit all those those marks. And so again, these are things we're checking ourselves against as we went along, as we iterated on this. And then we didn't want to have this, what we call CID, CICD pipeline specialists. We did some numbers on this and some calcs to, as to how much money were we saving by some of these things. And if you get down to it, any given team, if you're in a larger organization and people have their own pipelines, you end up having to have somebody that's kind of dedicated for that pipeline. They may not be 24 seven, 40 hours a week, always doing it. But when there's an issue with the pipeline, they have to drop everything and be right on that. So that becomes a very disruptive in, uh, thing to your other planning, maybe other work you'd like to have that person working on. Going back to that whole concept I mentioned about us 
actually trying to let people focus more on the development of code. So if we can give more predictability, it's hard to find the specialists, all those things. So we were like, okay, we want to see if we can start to reduce that reliance uh, for teams on that. And that'll also save them money and focus to where they want to be. And then again, can we actually abstract the underlying uh, technologies that drive the pipeline out. So we, yes, we use Jenkins under the covers. It, Jenkins does a lot of stuff for us that could just give us foundation that we could start on. We didn't have to do everything from scratch. There is a value to some of these key plugins. Somebody's got a plugin that lets me get to Git, uh, the different things. I need to send something to Splunk. Whatever it is, I have these plugins I can leverage, but let's minimize those, minimize them, and let's not have teams actually even have to worry about knowing we're using those. So those were kind of our key uh, principles on that front. All right, and so I'll just, uh, I think this is my last slide right here. What I just want to note was, if you're a shared service and you are supporting multiple teams with pipelines and all that, remember it's not just about the technology. You can build that really cool, awesome mousetrap. But if you don't focus on the customer, you might get theme here, it's customer, customer, customer. If you don't focus on that, uh, it can be, a, you'll have a real challenge. You can think you're listening to them or it's very easy to get into, yeah, but I know what's best for you. Well, listen to what a person has to say. Give them that chance to uh, provide you that uh, feedback. And that's really that third bullet is where we did this. We always gave a customer satisfaction and we were running at about a 4.9 out of five on a customer satisfaction with customers. It was a set of questions we put out. We tried to be very open about the questions we asked. We didn't try to be leading with those questions. Sometimes people put questions out and they're a little bit leading with assumptions under them. But it's just something to think about that as you do this, that you can do great things with technology, but if you don't remember who your customer is, the development teams, folks like that, yeah, you know, then you're, you might have a little bit of a struggle. So with that, I think, Robbie, do I turn it over to you? Uh, yes, uh, thanks, Martin. So, hey, uh, I'm Ravi Sharma. I will actually walk you through with the, the current physical architecture of the pipeline, which we have in T-Mobile. And then I will walk you through with the, the different features and the capability of the pipeline. Uh, what Martin actually just explained is uh, basically there are good things and everything what he talked about is about the customer actually. And we are really very customer focused. So whatever we have designed so far, like whether it is the physical architecture of our pipeline engine, when I say pipeline engine, it's nothing but I'm talking about the Jenkins here. And uh, the pipeline library, which is our uh, pipeline uh, framework, which, which we have developed is, so whenever we have designed any of these component, we have kept our customer in the center of the table and see that whether any solution we are designing is actually helping the customers or not. Because in the DevOps team, there are certain questions when you when you design a pipeline library in your organization, they have certain questions. Uh, when they start using the library itself is how easy is to do the onboarding onto the library basically. So if you have a new application, uh, you have a centralized team in your company. Is that taking care of all the onboardings of applications in your company or whether being a DevOps team, can the team take care by itself and how easy is that? And how much learning curve basically is required when you understand the pipeline? And another one is basically, so these are the actually our experiences from last seven years. We have on our hands with a lot of like, you know, different uh, ways of working on Jenkins and creating the library. And that's where we have come to a conclusion that this is the best architecture and the library we can actually design. Do we really need a dedicated resource? How we can extend our pipeline with the features and the capability if we need to add into our pipeline? There are a lot of duplicity happens when you have uh, the, the microservice uh, kind of model, a lot of duplicity happens there. Because in the microservices, you are having following the similar methods of you know, building the pipeline, testing the pipeline, and deploying on similar platforms. So we have the similar Jenkins file, which we need to repeat over and over again with all the components. Can we, can we have this duplicity uh, can be avoided actually? So there are certain questions when people ask to you. And uh, so one of the things which I will talk about right now is the physical architecture. So what we have basically done in this, uh, we are actually deploying uh, uh, deploying uh, our uh, Jenkins basically into the Kubernetes, uh, Kubernetes namespace. The Jenkins itself is into a, uh, uh, into the container, and then we are we are leveraging the uh, Kubernetes as well along with it. So as you can see in the picture here, the master itself is into the container, and then we have a persistence volume of the Jenkins home, which is right there on this, uh, on the on the Kubernetes space. And then we are leveraging uh, basically having only few, very few Jenkins uh, plugins basically. Uh, you know the plugins are basically the heart of the 
heart of the Jenkins. As more and more plugins you keep adding into the Jenkins, you get more and more features. But in this case, this, uh, we wanted to have a Jenkins which, which actually we have less number of plugins just to support our pipeline. So we used only basically four plugins to maintain into our pipeline engine here. And then we have step containers. So usually uh, all the step containers, which are basically build step container, these all are the build step containers and different components in your build file, which you are going to use. They spin up into the same, uh, into the same Kubernetes space. The, what else we have actually done is here is we have used the Splunk basically for the logging. We have used, uh, used AppD, AppDynamics, Spring Cloud Config Server. Basically we have used for our, uh, encrypted passwords to soar into the Spring Cloud Config Server. The reason being doing it is this whole setup is actually fully automated. So fully automated when I say we are using the Jenkins config as code, we are using Spring uh, Spring Cloud Config Server. So when the uh, Jenkins comes up, it takes like two minutes and some seconds to bring a new, uh, you know, a new instance of the Jenkins for us. And we are doing a horizontal scaling. So as of today, we are actually having 28 different uh, Jenkins uh, engines running for each team with the organization wide. And then we have, uh, what we have done basically is a backup utility to repo. So basically Jenkins Homes stores everything for you, right? And in this case, we have made Jenkins Home itself is a Git repository and every, every few minutes the job runs and it takes the Delta backup into the Bitbucket or the version control tool. So by using that, what happened is if everything if your Jenkins instance goes away by any chance, you can actually restore it again within the same uh, two minutes or few seconds, because first of all, the loading of the Jenkins is very easy for us. We are very, using very few uh, plugins into that. And then the, all the configurations are stored into Bitbucket and the version control tool. So it's easy to restore them back. Now we talk about the agents. So which are workers for the, for the Jenkins. So they can be spinned either onto the same Kubernetes space or they can be actually done onto another uh, Kubernetes. So for that, we are uh, using the dynamic uh, allocation of the agents and dynamic provisioning of the agents. Similar things we can do onto the AWS. So in our case, we are using both of them. And at the end, we have a Grafana dashboard. So whatever happens or all the steps when you execute in a pipeline, the, all the matrices are actually getting collected through the Grafana dashboard. Let me, so here is uh, uh, the few details about it. So the complete infrastructure is on Kubernetes, including Mastone agents. Each team actually gets their own pipeline engine. So that if something happens, like uh, it, they are isolated teams basically. So anything happens to one of the masters, the other teams are not getting impacted in this case. And for us, it's very easy to spin any, any number of masters on the Kubernetes space. So we are not worrying about those things. Jenkins config as code is highly utilized for us because we are using very minimum number of plugins and they are all pre-configured. Even we have like global credentials within your organization, like you have some global credential which can be used across the teams, but there are specific credentials which team would like to use. For that, we have provisioned folder level access. So the folder level access given to the team, they usually have the, the create the credentials which are specific to their applications within those folders so that nobody else can actually uh, see them. And it's a SOX compliance perspective as well. Using core uh, four core plugins, you can have as number of plugins you want actually. And I remember uh, before uh, coming up with this particular architecture, we had 200 plus plugins and uh, 200 plus main plugins. And you can think of the, the dependent plugin which get installed. So when I say four core plugins, basically these are the main plugins. You have some dependent plugin also get installed along with that. We have extended it to 16 plugin because like we are using like Splunk as well in that case. So one of them, somebody is looking for build times in because if you go into the UI, you need some plugins actually. So we have extended it them to 16 plugins into T-Mobile. We have removed a major dependency actually. So by storing the credential in vault. So what happened basically is like, you know, we have our credential stored right now into the vault. And through that we are using Spring Cloud Config Server. So all, when the Jenkins comes up and up and running, it actually brings everything from the, from the Spring Cloud Config Server in, uh, encrypted credentials and get them stored in the global uh, global credential um, in Jenkins. When I say almost zero maintenance, and that's a huge, uh, it used to be a huge pain when you have a single master actually. Maintaining the plugins, upgrading of the plugins actually is a, is a huge task uh, uh, for any organization. And if, and, and I have actually uh, faced that a lot. So, by, but going by, 
number of plugins when you when you don't use more number of plugins and you have like team wide jenkins it easy for us and the the whole process is highly automated for us and that's a really help us to to do the zero maintenance to come to that point so ravi yep mark wait here would it be okay if i injected a few questions that have arrived that are specific to the the things that you've described so far sure absolutely okay so so one of the questions is are you using jenkins job builder and my assessment was you're probably not jenkins job builder didn't look like it was involved in in the structure that you're doing no okay and are you using cloudbees jenkins are you using cloudbees core the product or jenkins the open source component to do the the jenkins instances this is open source jenkins thank you okay great yeah uh, thanks very much. And I'm continuing yeah. to gather other other questions. We'll I'll disrupt you periodically. Thanks again for letting me interrupt. Thank you. Okay. So uh, now I'll talk about the pipeline execution example, basically how the pipeline looks like and uh, with this design. So as you can see in this picture, there is a uh, the user who creates a pull request once he's done with his task and the on the source code and the source code in our case is basically into the bit bucket right now we have uh, something called pipeline definition file which is a yaml file where you store all of your steps steps in the sense like what all different steps you would like to perform as part of your pipeline you are doing some pre-built steps and then build step you are building with different uh, tools and technology or a programming language you use and then you you go for like notification sonar cube or testing and then deployment right so all the steps are mentioned into this pipeline definition file now the picture you see is all the clouds and the containers here each of the step is a container here in this case so you can say like about the build java 8 and maven is one of the container another slack notify which is again a container here sonar cube qcp notify and then fortify deploy to k8 k8 is nothing but it's a kubernetes uh, thing and then the last step if you see is which is influx db logging so which is basically the grafana uh, grafana logging we do so this whole pipeline steps run each of them runs like a container and we have something called pre and post which larry will explain you in detail so basically the once the pipeline gets run everything gets logged onto the grafana and it creates beautiful uh, beautiful graphs actually onto Grafana for us related to the pipeline itself, CICD. Now the picture which is down here, which is Poet Shared or use, Reusable Step Container Library. This is something actually we have created on, on our own, but there is an open source code available for this. So this step container library, what we have done so far is we have 40 plus different containers available for the mobile users. And these are very generic containers created on different tools and technologies and people the users can extend them. They can use the containers which we have created as a base image and they can extend those containers for their functionality into the pipeline. Now in this picture, actually, if you see, it's very easy to extend a pipeline. Now for a user or for a DevOps, uh, a DevOps team, basically, if they have to add something called JMeter, for example, I'm just taking an example of it, or they are actually deploying to a different platform, which can be AWS. In this case, they have to just create another container, which is we call them as a step container, and they have to add into their pipeline definition file, and it will extend the pipeline automatically. And that's how easy it is actually to extend and you know make sure that the pipeline is up and running with the new features. This is the sample of the pipeline code. And uh, as you see, like, you know, uh, and when I talk about this sample, basically, uh, there is not much learning for the development team into this. The learning in the sense, the development team should understand how to create Docker images, basically. They should understand how to read or update an YAML file. And that's the only two thing I expect from a development team when we say that they can extend and use this pipeline by themselves. In this, we have three component, basically. One is called global section. Another one is called global environment section. And third one is steps. And that's all is all about this, uh, this whole pipeline. In this case, the global section, you have to specify application name, basically what application or the microservices you are going to build, you have to specify that name, and then you have application version. So as you see, we have branch wise versions here, like master has 2.4.2 in this case, the feature branch has like 2.4.1. The reason being is here uh, having the branch wise version, basically, if you have a master branch and you are creating uh, creating a child branch out of it or a feature branch, you can actually have, uh, and when you are 
created the feature branch and you are doing the pipeline, uh, your pipeline is running. So it's actually getting built on 2.4.1. But when you start merging your feature branch into the master, you will get some time conflicts in the sense, if the feature branch also has 2.4.2 and it will override onto the, the master branch. In this case, you can keep the version separate for features and master. That's how this app version works. Then you have global environments. So think about a situation where you are writing a program basically, and in that program or a cell scripts or any language, you are, you are defining a lot of environment variables, which you wanted to use throughout in your program. Like you have the different classes or you are, uh, uh, and you wanted to use those environment variables. So similar things you have to define here. Now the next thing is basically steps. So steps are nothing but what all different activities you are going to perform as a part of your pipeline. So you have to define, now step has minimum three components here, which is name, basically jar build. I would, uh, I generally recommend people to use hyphen to make sure like, you know, your UI looks good instead of space here. And then you have an image, of, uh, which is the step container. So this image is basically contains all of your tools uh, which are required to complete that particular step. So in this case, I'm having a Maven build and I need a JDK 8. So that's installed in this image. And then I have a command section. So when I talk about this command section, basically, it's nothing but a, it's a, it's a plain ground where you have like, it's a VM for you now to start writing all different commands you would like to execute in that particular image when it's startup as a container. So Right now, the example is basically given as with one command, you can create multiple commands. Basically, if you understand the concept of YAML file, when you see the hyphen, it means it's an array of the commands. You can write as much, many commands as you want. The second option is basically you write a script in a cell script, and then you can call that cell script here, but the cell script should be available into your source control group. Third one, and all the, all the environment variables, which are, we have defined at the global level are basically, you can utilize them. You can see the build container, the environment variable we defined at the environment section of the global is basically we are using into the image here. Similar way, now you have another step. You wanted to do a Docker image build. Once you have your jar file ready, you wanted to use the jar file and create an image out of it. Then you write the next step, uh, step basically, hyphen name, again, the name step of the name, image and command. So you keep writing this with all the step containers using into it and your pipeline keep enhancing. So as everybody, I think people over here are very well versed about the pipeline library, which is a groovy code, which we have to write. Now, all of the people might have experienced that if we provide a library to a development team and we ask them to start extending that library using Groovy. I, first of all, this Groovy is not a normal Groovy, which is not a, a specific, it's very specific to Jenkins. And it's hard for a development team to understand the internal, internals of Jenkins and how they can actually convert that into a Groovy, which is specifically used for pipeline. But in this case, if you see, this is just a complete YAML file you have to have the containers available and you should know what commands you are going to use against them. And that is all about this, this complete pipeline, uh, pipeline framework. And that's why we call it as pipeline framework because the framework don't need to be changed in the sense until unless you have a great feature coming in and you need to have it distributed to all the development teams, then only you just go back to your library now and change it. The rest of the features, for example, you are going to have a JMeter. You don't need to go back to your library and add those dependencies into your Groovy code, but rather you just create a container right now and that will help you to extend your features and the capability in your pipeline. Pipeline value. So most of the things which I just uh, was speaking about is here. So it's a framework where the pipeline execution is defined by each team basically. So anybody in the development team, you don't need a specific person or a specialist in your team basically to just work on the pipeline, extend the pipeline features. No, any developers can do that in the YAML file. Easier and faster onboarding. So, and this is proven with us that any application or any microservices, if you have all the information in hand, you can actually onboard an application in less than one hour on point pipeline. And that's what we have we have been doing with the with the within, within our team about. So no big YAML or Groovy script maintained. Yes, the same thing which I just explained that it just you don't have to have a big YAML. The, in this case, also we are using YAML, and if you have like 20 different steps to perform, 
you will absolutely say that like you know the yaml file is getting increased again it's a big yaml but for to solve that problem we have actually introduced templates which is the next step you reusable templates so the the templates when i say basically is every step which you are writing into the yaml file can be converted into a templates and the same templates let's say for example you have 100 plus microservices you do the same way build maven build you do you have the docker builds again and then you are using sonar cube and other different but they are all the microservices are following the same way of having your pipeline or what uh, building your pipeline now if i used this particular yaml file then i have check out 100 different repositories and i have to check in the same yaml file over and over again into that let's say i i got another features need to be or capability need to be added into the template now what will happen again i have to check out all of my 100 repositories and i have to update my pipeline.yaml which is a definition file but what if i have a template if i create a template out of that repository in a different repo altogether and maintain all the templates and then include those templates into my main pipeline.yaml file what will happen is tomorrow if any change happen in capabilities and features basically you will be doing that in a separate repository all together and which is not not impact your current pipeline even some cases i i have seen that if you change any pipeline specific files it starts a build because it's a auto build as soon as you check in into a code repository it start another build which is not required sometime because it's it's a pipeline specific file it's not a code change but when you have a separate repository all together to maintain these templates it means you are not changing your core pipeline.yml file in your source code and any changes to these files will not do a rebuild of your code actually that's how these templates will work and i will i'm going to actually show you into uh, how these templates works and how you can include easily into the into the pipeline.yml file which is a definition file step containers uh, again i already speak about it spec step container is nothing but you have a specific container for specific task in this case and you have to in this in our case we have a library for that and you can use the the docker hub to have these containers to include in your consistency of approach and application across so it's the same thing because you do the build pipeline all the steps are similar same approach same consistency across all of your microservices when you start building it low maintenance because of the templates we have the templates reusable templates and the step container library which are placed at one place so you don't need to maintain them all of your microservices code base this is the sample pipeline screenshot uh, i'm not going to do a demo right now on this one but this is uh, how it looks like in jenkins when you when you have different step containers and they are building through the pipeline uh, i will switch back to the uh, to the wiki uh, which is on the github and i will walk you through a few of the features and capability of the pipeline now so here's the wiki for uh, uh, for the poet pipeline how you basically do the installation of the pipeline so i think we have just updated uh, pipeline engine masters like the infrastructure which we have built with us which is a complete automated system for us to stand up a new jenkins all the steps and the source code is available here for you to stand up the jenkin so you can uh, uh, if you start you know following these steps you will be able to stand up a jenkin within within minutes that's that's for sure and then how you do the library setup so you know that there is a plugin called global pipeline library in jenkins you just need to have this code ready and then update the configurations into the into the library global library sections and you will be up and running in your jenkins in our case basically what we have done this is again automated along with our jenkins when we stand the jenkins up so these things are very pre filled configured for us when the jenkins comes up now how to section basically it's uh, the getting started with the pipeline so when you start working on the pipeline you need two files one is jenkins file another one is pipeline.yml file and i think all the jenkins lovers knows that the jenkins file contains where is your library basically which you define into the into the plugin just now in in the previous section so you just need to provide those details here and the jenkins file should be part of each microservices in in your repository and it never change until unless you are actually changing a branch or any other information related to that it doesn't change frequently and then we have pipeline.yml pipeline.yml is nothing but it's again the same thing like you have the steps global section and the steps defined within the pipeline.yml file 
Now, what core plugins we need? So this is, I think, uh, in between it came in the steps. So I will just let you know. These are the four plugins, core plugins you need to set up the whole Jenkins and to make it make the pipeline framework up and running. You don't need more than that. You can install more than that. Like we have 16 of them. It's because we are looking for different other other features in the Jenkins to work on, like Splunk. We, we, we are logging our logs into the Splunk, so we need a Splunk plugin. That's why we install extra plugin. Otherwise, the pipeline works with these minimum four plugins. Now we'll talk about what different things you can write into the pipeline.yaml. Uh, and thanks to Larry, uh, he has uh, put the schema together. So if you are not sure, like you know, any any of the components or any of the the, the variables which you are writing into the into the pipeline.yaml, are they the integer type or string type or what should be the length or different validation? I think you can you can go through with these schemas and you will understand more about it. Now we have different sections in the in the pipeline.yaml. One is header, basically, so it has the version and the pipeline section here. Then you have the global section where you define the application name and the application version. After that, we have a global environment variable where you specify the, the environments which you are going to use into your step containers. So again, and then we have steps. So these three, uh, three components will be the part of the pipeline.yaml. Now let's walk you, let me walk you through with the step section basically. What different things or what, what different components or the variables you can use into the step container. In this you can see we have environment, conditions, secrets and control. So I will walk you through in a brief in, about this. So a minimum step containers looks like you have a name, you have an image which, which is your container when it will spin and you have the command section. You can write the command or you can pipe them commands, uh, pipe all, multiple commands into single or you can have a script to execute in this section basically. Now, we have something called specific uh, environment variables you can define within the step, which is basically, uh, it's like you have global environment variables you can use across multiple steps. And then you have specific environment variables which you would like to use within a single step. And that's what is this section about. So you can define the environment variables here. Now you see if in this particular image tag, I'm using something called pipeline underscore app underscore version. This is wherever you see like pipeline underscore, these are the naming conventions. These environment variables are already exposed by the pipeline library. These are not user defined, but you can override them as you start writing your pipeline or the command section, you can start overriding them and that's possible. Then we have something called condition. So uh, the conditions basically, let me give an example of, uh, you know, how we use condition. So in this case, we have a when clause, which says branch master. The, the, the reason for that, uh, the meaning of this basically is this particular step will only execute when the branch name is master. So let's say you have, you are working on multiple features and you have taken out branch out of it, right? Now with a single pipeline.yaml, you don't want to, to uh, you know, delete or update or any of the steps from the single pipeline.yaml, which got inherited from master to that feature branch to make sure that I just wanted to execute something to deploy on Q QAT environment, but I don't want to do it in uh, my feature branch, right? Or this particular step, I don't want to execute in my feature branch. In that case, you can use the when clause. And that's where you are actually writing, I can only execute this step for the master, master when the branch is master. Now there are different ways to define that. You might have, uh, you might want to write multiple uh, expressions for that. I have a master and release branch. This particular step I will execute in master and release for both the branches, but not for the feature branches. In some other cases, you can write a feature slash star. Basically it means this per one of the particular step is only going to execute when the branch is feature slash star. There is another way to include and exclude as well. So in this basically we have master and feature slash star, but in the feature, uh, you basically wanted to exclude few other uh, branches to execute that particular step. So this is how, and I think this is one of the important thing when you when you have uh, you know parallel development going on and you don't want to execute all the step defined in a pipeline.yaml as a part of your execution. Now there's something called environment condition. So for a particular step, you wanted to skip that step because uh, based on the environment variables. So two type of environment variable we talk about. One is user defined environment variables and another one is uh, pipeline exposed or the standard environment variables which we have. In this case, you have a when clause and you can say environment, basically pipeline commit message. If the pipeline commit message is skip CI, 
exclude that. So it means that particular step, as soon as it will see a message is entered as skip CI, it will exclude that particular step from execution. Similar way you have user defined uh, environment variables here, which is deploy environment QLab or QAT basically. So what it will do is it, this particular step will only execute if it sees that particular step is for QLab. The environment variable is true QLab. And then in the next example, you can combine the, the user defined, it's a, it's a little complex one. You can, you can have that kind of condition, uh, you know, defined in your step as well to execute. So further, if I start with the secret. So now we talked about step containers and I think by this time you understand what we mean about the step containers, right? Any steps, let's say if you have an example of, uh, you wanted to publish your artifacts into an artifact tree or a Docker registry, right? In that case, we usually store, uh, uh, when we maintain the pipeline engine, we have global credentials. Those credentials can be used by anyone, but in artifact tree or in the registry, Docker registry, there are specific credentials required by each team where they are authorized to place their artifact. Now those credentials, either they have to put into the, the folder level, but when they are writing a step, how we inject those variables into the, the step. So that's why the secret is basically, secrets helps, uh, you know, the section helps them to define. Right now, uh, I admit that right now this, uh, the Poet pipeline only supports two different kind of secrets. One is username and passwords, and another one is secret token, basically the single token. So only two are supported right now. So we need to work on the rest of them, like SSH if you have to use, and there are different other credentials types. So in this case, you can see the source. Source is nothing but it's uh, the credential ID in Jenkins. When you define a credential at folder level or at global level, that's the, the credential ID. Target is, are the variable names where you store username and passwords. Now they becomes a variable within the container which you have specified here. And once they become a variable, you can use them into your command section to, to run your commands. And that's why the secret sections help us to do the jobs which requires credentials to run that particular step. Now we have certain control options as well, which is timeout in minutes. So this particular, this is one of my favorite basically because I have, uh, being an administrator or like, you know, taking care of the, the whole infrastructure, I need to make sure that, you know, the resource utilization is, is good for me. And for that, if a job we start running and it get hung at a, at a time, so we sometimes don't know that how long that job is going to be hung. Either we get a report back and say we have to kill those jobs. So in this particular case, we have put a limit of like 30 minutes. Uh, I think I'm hearing an echo, so just a minute. So 30 minutes is the, the time where you can... Okay, hold on guys. Um, I'm hearing the echo actually. So none of the rest of us are hearing it, Ravi. You're sounding great. Although if you would like, I would be delighted to interrupt you again with some more questions. Uh, are you sure, at a absolutely. point where you'd be okay with being interrupted? Yeah, yeah, of course. Please go ahead. Okay, so one of the, one of the questions was related to um, parallelization and I think you had, you had indicated that this is not parallelizable, but then Larry answered online that, oh, hey, you can parallelize inside a container. Again, the, the con fundamental concept is a container here. That, right. That's, for me, a really elegant concept that you're using. Right. We had so, another um, question. Oh, uh, go ahead. Yeah, I would like to answer, I mean, um, that. So there are two kinds of parallelism we talk about. One, we talk about, can we group uh, multiple steps to run in parallel and in a single group, right? Second one is within a particular step container, which is a, like it's a container base. So within a step, you can, you, can, you can run something like in the cell script or a tool which can do the parallel execution of the commands. So parallel command execution and parallel step executions to different thing. Parallel step execution right now, uh, I will, I mean, I have that slide too to explain that that's a functionality gap right now that you cannot execute parallel steps, but yes, you can do parallel command execution within your step. Thank you, thanks very much. Yeah, uh, next question, please. Oh, next question, okay. So um, we had a question, are you using Azure or Oracle Cloud infrastructure? What's your, what's your chosen infrastructure hosting? maybe not so much as vendor as technique. It seems like it's all Kubernetes based. Could you expand a little bit on that? So yes, uh, 
we are using uh, it's kubernetes based for us but uh, you can actually the way we have uh, designed this whole uh, automation for uh, provisioning the pipeline engine which is jenkins you can actually do it on your laptop too so you can have uh, you can have the kubernetes on your laptop and you can install so it's kubernetes but the agents you can spin off kubernetes as well as on aws using ecs plugin yeah um... Right. So just a little bit more there for folks. So we uh, internally, uh, other teams, there's teams responsible for platforms uh, here. And one of the, we have a Pivotal came out with their own Kubernetes platform. We went through about three Kubernetes platforms, <laughs> uh, Heptio and a, another one. And then we ended up uh, where we've, they settled on was the Pivotal Kubernetes. It's just, it's Kubernetes with Pivotal kind of putting some of their own UI in front of it. But everything that we do and do it is, is from the perspective of using Helm charts to get the deployments going. So if you were to use AWS, uh, Kubernetes, absolutely, or Azure, uh, this is, it really should be pretty much a fairly straight because we're using Helm and charts uh, to okay. do those things for our deployments. So, so I find that especially interesting. That means you've been through multiple Kubernetes providers and still using these same concepts so that you've, you've confirmed by hard experience that the concepts are portable across Kubernetes providers. That's really excellent. Yeah, uh, I th think a lot of the pipeline that we went through, I think I would say two kind of, the, we, we, we were doing additional containers in our work before that and then as they really settled out on uh, last year settled out towards the end of the year going into the beginning of this year to the pivotal platform but yes uh, it's been good to see that and a docker container is generally a docker container all rules that people need to do to do good design for containers and security and all that uh, apply you still need to be mindful of those things but uh, absolutely works that way and then as the Ravi had had that diagram up earlier that talked about where we didn't, uh, how do I put it? We we show the AWS and it says VM, quote unquote. There's a few times where we've needed to have a slave and something to run that was just more efficient running it, not in a container, but it needed to be on a VM, might be a lot of files that needed to be there that needed to be persisted or it took so long to download all the libraries. So there were some things like that that we've done um, and just you have the ability to also people could spin up their own other types of implementations like that as well. Thank you. Thanks very much, Martin. Okay, so, so uh, yeah, please go ahead, Mark. Do you have any more questions? No, the, let's, let's pause for questions and let you resume, Ravi. Excuse the disruption and thank you for your patience with my asking questions. Thanks very much. No problem. Uh, so yeah, we were talking about like, you know, a few of the other features, which is control option within the pipeline, which is timeout in minutes. So by default, uh, any job which executes through this pipeline, basically it get aborted if it doesn't get complete within 30 minutes. But if there are jobs or the steps you think that will take more than 30 minutes, in this case example, you can see we have specified 120. So that particular step will not get aborted for another two hours. But after two hours, if the job still don't get complete, then it get aborted. And that's how you can specify within, like, you know, if it takes less number of minutes, you can specify that. Or if it takes more than 30 minutes, you can specify that too for a particular step. And that's how this option is used. And this is very efficient because it helps us to do this resource utilization. If my agents are actually tied up with the master for a long time with the job stuck, I cannot provide my resources to other jobs. And when I implement this feature, basically, we can, we can abort the job we are stuck and then free up our resources and allocate it to different jobs. Something we have like continue on error, uh, which is basically uh, when you design your pipeline, you know the best that like if there is a step which is failing over and over again, but you, you would like to go with the next step to see and proceed further. In that case, this continue on error will help for the particular step. So if this particular step is failing and you want to do mark as true, so even if it is a failure, it will proceed for the next step executions. And that's how this, this continue on error is, is used. Now, let me uh, just go over with the standard environment variables. Uh, so there is a list of standard environment variables, which you can, uh, you don't need to declare them. You can directly use them into the pipeline steps here. And then if you would like to know more about the environment variables, there are more into the pipeline state JSON. There are hundreds, hundreds of them. You can directly use them into your pipeline. You can override the variables as you like and as you go. We have few pipeline control options. So. The reason having this pipeline control option is basically uh, 
they works onto the jenkin file so earlier i said you don't need to update the jenkin file over and over again it's a one time activity when you place it in your source code but there are certain operations which you would like to do like for example you would like to do the log level so as of today if you see when we start writing the uh, the pipeline library in groovy we utilize this Jen jenkins file heavily and all of the features and capability we had added to that so the similar way you can actually if you have to change the log level you can you can do that directly into the into the jenkins file right now by default the pipeline basically works uh, use a file called pipeline.yaml which is a definition file but Let's suppose you would like to use a different YAML file. The name is, should be different in your source code. Then you have to come back into the Jenkins file and you have to specify that here. Once you specify, it will take the different pipeline YAML file or the definition file and start the execution over that and start parsing it. Now the, uh, the last features and which is very interesting and important is the templates. So I already explained you about like, you know, why templates are useful. They are usable for us. So let's say we have a, there are two different type of templates you can create. You can have a location at the local repositories where your source code is available, or you can have them in a remote repository altogether and then include them. So in this case, you can see the step library, which is, uh, uh, sorry, the steps we are writing for, uh, into the YAML file. Now I'm converting them step, those steps into the templates, which is I have a template folder, I have a slack.yaml. This particular step is for Slack. I took this out from the main pipeline.yaml and I put it into a different YAML file, which is slack.yaml. That becomes my template right now. And I'm keeping that into the same repository. Now what happened is when I start writing my pipeline.yaml, the main definition file, which is in my code, I write the pipeline, I start the steps. I can write the steps as I like as well. Along with that, I can include with the hyphen include option, the templates which I have just written within the same repository. And that's how you can include those templates in your main YAML file. And there are different ways of doing that. Even you can create a template for your global configurations. You can create a microservice environment level configuration and you can just put that into all, all that also into a template. The shortest pipeline.yaml you will see is basically pipeline, include, and the template. That's the shortest one you can see. So we uh, we recommend people to use uh, pipe, uh, templates like template and template within template. It can go deeper, but we don't recommend to go by that route. The reason being is if you have a, a, num a number of microservices you are using, but you don't want to change your pipeline.yaml over and over again when you add or update new steps or new functionality or new features into your pipeline. So what you basically do is you can take the whole thing out into a template outside and include the main template into the, into the pipeline.yaml. So any changes further will happen will happen into the template, not into the main pipeline.yaml file or the definition file. Now let's say, uh, let's talk about remote repositories. So if I have a remote repositories and how can I include that? So I have a remote repositories where I'm creating a template here with the steps. You can include multiple steps within the same template as well. So that's also possible. So it depends on like how you wanted to utilize these templates. There is no hard and fast rule here on this one. Basically, when you create templates outside of the code repository, you have to use something called resources. And then you have to start adding those repositories where your template resides. So again, as we understand, you can, it's an hyphen and it's an array. So you can include as many repositories, template repositories into the section, keep repeating that. So if you have five lo different locations where you are, have, uh, your templates are residing, you can write all of them here. In this case, you have to provide the template name, the URL where the template, the repository of the templates and the label is nothing but your branch, which branch actually they are residing and credential ID so that you can, uh, the, the pipeline have access to that, those templates. And now you start writing the pipeline steps, you include them with the at the rate template with their name. And you can start including like this. And that's how these templates you can uh, include from the remote repositories. I can, uh, there are more details. I think uh, uh, you guys can go through and let me know if you have any questions. I will switch back to uh, the presentation now. I need 
Would you put this on? This is the play mode for this. So I'm handing over this to Larry uh, to talk more about the internals uh, of the pipeline. Um, Thanks, Ravi. Um, over to you, Larry. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I wanted to cover, I mean, kind of at a high level, but, you know, the the engine design and what we thought about and how things are organized. And so, as you can probably tell from the examples Ravi went through, it's heavily inspired by some other modern container-based pipelines like Drone, um, the Azure uh, pipeline, Cloud Build, and the Bitbucket pipelines. And we kind of stole some of the best ideas and merged that with our thinking around pipelines and the features we provided. Um, I think it's also nice because if you have developers that are familiar with some of these other pipelines, they should feel pretty much at home. You know, it works, they're all very, very similar. Um, and in fact, we even thought about, you know, writing converters that go to and from different formats if people wanted to play around with different pipelines. Um, so some design goals for the, the code itself. You know, we wanted things to be really easy to test. So that was a big goal, making things testable. And so we ended up, you know, really kind of isolating a lot of the Jenkins, the Jenkins functionality. And as Ravi mentioned, limiting the number of plugins we use just to make things really testable and be able to test quickly the core code itself. We also wanted to structure things so that we didn't have to change the core code very often. Um, so the main exception point really is, you know, by is containers, adding new containers to do that. Um, and we lean on this, you know, very heavily. And also we're not the bottleneck here. Other groups can add their own functionality or whatever they want. In fact, you can use, um, you know, third party, you know, containers, any, you know, container, totally fine. Uh, the execution engine is totally generic. And so this was another big goal and something we had to push ourselves on a lot was that the pipeline engine doesn't know anything about the containers. Like I said, you can use off the shelf containers. Like, you know, we use the Gradle container just directly from Docker Hub, totally fine. Um, and, you know, this, it was a little bit of effort, right? It would have been easier if the pipeline engine knew certain things about the containers or the containers about the pipeline engine, but we really, you know, try to make this generic. I think it paid, it paid off in the end. Um, so the pipeline handles all the step execution and error handling and things like that, but has no knowledge of the internals of the, pipe, of the containers at all. The containers have access to the pipeline state information. So this is something we do expose, like Ravi mentioned, um, there's a lot of built-in variables. Um, environment variables that are all in the wiki. And besides just some kind of simple information like you would see in a normal Jenkins job, we also have um, one of the variables points to a file that has the total state of the entire pipeline. So if you want to implement a container that does things like, you know, updates a dashboard or sends a Slack or email notification, you have the full information of the pipeline state available in a JSON file. That's, you know, like each, each step, it's, it's um, status, what the steps were and everything like that is all available as a step. Um, also the steps shared the same workspace. So that was a really important way to share information between, you know, from step to step. If you think about it, it's kind of normal for a pipeline, right? Like you're, you're building code and then running tests and, you know, obviously it's helpful to have access to the same workspace. And that's another way you can share information between steps is by running files to the workspace. Okay, so the implementation, so it's implemented as a Jenkins share library. So if you use one of those before, it's basically, you know, it's doing the same thing. Like uh, Ravi mentioned, it's using like Groovy, the Groovy CPS code, um, a very small core. Like I said, we wanted to push functionality to the containers as much as possible, including things that you would normally think about as built in. And we thought a lot about built in, like, you know, we had a lot of debates internally about how to implement like things like notifications and reporting. Um, it seems like those should be built into the, into the pipeline, but Again, we pushed ourselves to make those just normal containers like everything else, and that's, that's how they work. Uh, again, limited use of plugins to keep things you know, small and, and um, testable. Like I mentioned before, testable code is a priority. Uh, currently, it's 117 unit tests. Um, you know, always good to have more. We also have a lot of just, uh, I think there's 58 test pipeline files in there right now, so that as we add changes, you we know, want to make sure that we can move quickly and add new functionality if we needed to without breaking any existing customers. You know, having backward compatibility was again a big, big priority. Um, also the pipeline builds itself, you know, so, um, you know, if you look in the, the repository, there's a pipeline that YAML file that we use, you know, it basically just runs the tests and does some Slack notifications, I think. Um, 
but just to make sure we had a lot of exposure to the pipeline as you're building the pipeline and you know able to test out features uh, right away was, was uh, important. So I also wanted to cover how do you extend the pipeline functionality. And so as I mentioned, like the main extension point really is by adding new containers. And so obviously things like build test deployment notification, those are all there. You know, but like I said, reporting notification even are when is there. And, and that ended up being really useful because even things like Slack notifications, we ended up with like three or four different ways to do it because some teams, you know, just want a really quick, simple Slack message like, hey, something didn't work, you know, go to this link and see what happened. Some teams want to like, you know, each step, as each step completes, update a Slack message. Um, so you get like step-by-step -step progress in, you know, in real time. Um, we even added like kind of a Slack bot to handle some of this functionality. And so I think by keeping things um, separated in this way, it ended up being really flexible. We didn't have to like, again, modify the core pipeline code because one team wanted different notifications. It's all totally user extensible. Also the templates, like, oh, the question? Uh, no, um, Larry, I, I would like to, I mean, do you think like I should, uh, um, I have this link here. So, which is uh, the shared library uh, we have. So, they are oh, like, yeah. uh, so this is the shared library, which we, we use at T-Mobile basically. And it has like 40 plus different generic containers for each of the, uh, each of the tools and technology we are using in T-Mobile, it's all listed here. And the, the best thing what we do is here is if you click on any of the containers or you can search, we, we provide the, the step emails and what versions it has and how you can recommend you uh, recommended users for that. So the team don't need to like, you know, search or like type anything. They just can copy paste this whole thing into their definition file in the step and then, then fill in the details and start using it. So this is, uh, this is how, and you can search any of the containers. You just type in, you will get all of the, the build types and you'll get the information. So yeah, um, circling back to you, Larry. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, thanks for, that's a good, uh, yeah. And so a lot of those containers, um, you know, were built by our team, but a lot of them were also built by other teams and contributed, you know, into this bigger poll, which I think was really awesome. And um, yeah, that website, um, this is another shout out to Drone. Um, we kind of stole this idea from them. They have like, you know, similar plugin index for, for the plugin. Their plugins, you know, are, are working the same way. Um, and so we took their, they have an open source um, website for their design of that. We use the same thing. And in fact, a lot of those drone plugins, like I mentioned, there's nothing special about these steps. They're just any container really. Um, you can use some of the drone plugins in our pipeline too. And I think in, in our wiki, we have some examples of like for Slack using the drone Slack plugin just as is. There's nothing special about it. Um, oh, I just wanted to mention that the templates are another, um, back on the previous slide, Ravi, like the, t the templates, which we, we talked about is another really good way to share functionality. So um, they really allow you to abstract out complex logic and sharing. So like for these containers that, that we built, you know, a lot of them have the same kind of build stuff, which is like, you know, you're building some source code and then you're building the Docker container and then you're um, testing the container, we utilize like the Google, container tests um, to do a lot of testing. And then you're, you know, publishing the container. And so we ended up just for all of these, we have a template that's like, you know, build standard container. And that way everyone working on these containers can build them in the same way in a repeatable way. Um, and it's almost like a mini, it gives you a mini API into more complex logic. So you might have, you know, a template that's like send notification and internally it might, you know, call a Slack bot and then maybe do some do an email and do something else and you can just expose a very simple interface to developers to reuse and even can have its own inputs by using environment variables they can provide when you include the container and that ended up being really powerful. Okay so um, another extensibility point is this idea that Ravi touched on earlier a little bit about pre and post steps and so as you're building this out again we wanted to keep the core really small but there are some functionality we wanted to run every time and so originally yeah we had the um, like reporting here, this shows like the influx reporting we ended up building and that's implemented as a container. Um, but we had to add it to every single pipeline and that, you know, got to be a little burdensome, um, even though you can, like I said, simplify that with the, um, templates. What we ended up doing was like at the Jenkins administrator level, you can define kind of, um, a, a global template repository and we'll automatically load some pre and post steps. And these are kind of mini pipelines. And so there's nothing special about these. It's almost like basically we add like a, 
a pre-pipeline, the user pipeline, and then a post pipeline. And so you can define ahead of time, like an example would be, let's say you didn't want the pipeline to run unless all the images in there had been scanned by an internal scanner. You can implement that as, um, as a pre-step and then you can fail the pipeline before it even gets to the user code. And for the post side, like if you're gonna do special reporting like we did for Influx or something like that, you can, you can do that too. Um, what I wanna say about this. And these are all, um, again, implemented as pipelines. And so all the stuff that Robbie talked about for a normal pipeline, like it's all container-based, it's, it's a list of steps, you can use environment variables, you can use conditionals, it's all the same. Uh, that was another thing, you know, we wanted to keep the syntax like the small, so that we don't have a lot of concepts, but we kind of reuse them in different places to make it, you know, it's very flexible, you can do a lot with it, but there's not a lot of concepts you really need to, to know to do any of this. Uh, via PR, so again, if there's, if there's something you wanna, you wanna add, um, everything is open source. And like I said, we have a, a decent test suite already, and so you can feel confident you can submit a PR, and you know, as long as it passes the test, and you know, add new tests uh, for the new functionality, that would be great. I know a lot of people are asking about doing um, the parallel builds. So that's something we, we don't have. We, we talked about um, maybe some other things. Um, so you know, we would love to see contributions. And you know, we're happy to discuss the approaches. If you want to like open a PR or, or issue, you're not sure where to start. We can help you point you in the right direction for sure. Well, Larry, Larry, that's that's a great thing for me to hear that. Okay, this is available, open source. Your team is the team at T-Mobile is continuing and willing to listen to pull requests, evaluate them, have discussions about them. Uh, that's that's really amazing. Any concerns you have, or any things where you say, "Oh, please don't don't go this direction or that direction." Um, I'll let, <laughs> let Martin and Ravi answer that. I think, I think one thing is if it's something like, for example, the parallel steps or something that would be a big change, it's, I think it probably would be helpful to have a discussion about it first because there, there are a lot of like something like parallel steps, for example, the reason it's not there right away is because it seems like an easy thing to say, let me run these steps in parallel, but it's actually very complex, right? If you think about it, because what do you really mean by that? Do you mean like, I want to run multiple steps on the same agent or do you mean I want to have different agents like in a Kubernetes cluster running steps in parallel, in which case the workspace is no longer shared. How do you merge the workspace? Um, and how do you kind of branch off and fork? And so it's obviously very complex. And so if it's something like that, right, obviously it would probably be helpful to start a discussion first about your approach before you invest a lot of time into it because there are a lot of trade-offs, right? And so um, it's something to keep in mind. But yeah, I think Ravi or Martin could probably answer it better about. Yeah, something else I'll just mention that is also a Definitely familiarize yourself with the pipeline, the concepts, and, and run it a bit. Uh, one of the things that we did run into is that some teams would say, hey, we need XYZ plugin added in, uh, where really the, the answer was, no, we'll do that with a step container. Uh, and you implement the step container. But it's sometimes hard to get out of that habit of, oh, I get a plugin, I'll add some more groovy code into my pipeline to make something happen. And so there's a some just getting used to that for some folks was a little bit. But once they got it, then they're like, oh, rock and roll, and they were, they were fine. But that would be another thing that I would suggest is definitely familiarize yourself. The power of the templates, some of the conditioning. I saw some you know, great questions being asked about, hey, what do you do with errors? And Robbie kind of touched on that a little bit. We do have these when conditions and things. So uh, definitely a good place to start getting used to it, familiarize. And then you know, go under the covers a little bit, take a look at that code that Larry uh, had developed to get yourself there. And then, yeah, absolutely, like Larry said, post an issue or other things for questions and we can talk about some of those things to help folks if they've got those types of inquiries. Well, yeah, one other thing to keep in mind is that um, if you're familiar with like check and share libraries, you probably know this, but if not, it's maybe worth mentioning that um, it's groovy code, but it's not really groovy code because it's executed by Jenkins um, using this continuation passing style. And so um, if you look at the code and you might notice there's some kind of funny things like why are you using these simplified for loops with like four I instead of, you know, um, you know, a, a, a more modern for loop, it's because it, it's not supported by the Jenkins CPS groovy. And so um, that's something to keep in mind. Any more questions, Mark? Or, um... So yeah, I've got I've got several. So if you're okay, are you okay going into some further questions? Uh, so just let me uh, finish this slide, and I think we can take the questions and answers like you know for another rest of the time. Thank you. Is it okay? Thank you. So uh, 
I just want to touch base with the, the pipeline limitation of functionality. One of them we already, we talk about the parallel step execution, but uh, right now it doesn't support Windows and iOS build, but there is a way around we have done for the iOS build. Basically it's all about containers. So within the container, if you do the SSH and you can reach to the to the server, basically you can uh, deploy or you know, uh, you can take care of the iOS builds too in that case. But right now Windows, uh, you have to do a hard, Hardwire connection of the with the Jenkins and then use the freestyle job or the other jobs the way you you write it uh, uh, currently. Uh, and then just to summarize it a little bit, uh, so if you if you see like you know whatever we have speak uh, you know the values we have added into the uh, T-Mobile using this pipeline is is not only one component but there are different components which have really helped us uh, the infrastructure which we have built. Uh, the pipeline library or the framework which we have built and the, the kind of support model which we have within the organization. So which has allowed us save a lot of money and you know added values with us, uh, you know, with the company and the customer focus, you know, uh, driven approach. So these components has ha helped us to, you know, uh, make sure that uh, we add, you know, the values into the syst existing system um, uh, using this uh, pipeline library. Uh, by this, I, I conclude from my side, and yes, we can take a question and answer. Uh, here are our contacts, uh, if you'd like to touch base with me, Martin, and Larry. Thanks, Mark. Thanks very much, Ravi. So, so I've got a couple of questions that have come to my mind. I wanna, I'm gonna give personal bias first, so forgive me putting myself at the top of the queue to ask my questions. Definitely. So you mentioned customer support as a challenge. Were there techniques you found as you were helping your customers adopt this that were helpful and others that you found, oh, we thought would be helpful and ultimately were not helpful in getting adoption? Uh, so yeah, that's a, that's a really good question actually. So uh, because I, I particularly mentioned that we were customer focused. So all the features, if you see in this pipeline, what we designed, uh, and you know, while we were do, doing the design discussion, actually, so uh, uh, you know, even Martin, Larry, and a lot of other folks from our team, we usually talk about, okay, we we are designing this particular features, and we keep the customer in focus that whether this is a simple approach for customers or the people or the developers who will be using it. If it's not simple, then we have to go by other alternative approach. So that's the one thing we do. So the whole design was completely focused for the customers, uses for the customers, actually. Second thing, this pipeline was so simple that for me, it was easy to, to get trained teams. So what I usually do is when we start onboarding people on, our, on, on, on this particular pipeline, because we are a centralized team, but if you see, we are like, uh, I think I haven't mentioned, we are a people of like a team of seven people, right? We maintain the infrastructure, we maintain the pipeline too, but the pipeline library is, we are not extending it over and over again. We don't need to write the groovy code always. So what happened is it's always extensible using the Docker containers, right? And what approach we took is we trained the development team. I usually like, if I tell you correctly, I have given like less than four hours trainings for each of the teams in T-Mobile and to make them train and let them do a POC by themselves, do hands-on and then start working on on this pipeline. So the, the, the benefits I got from it is basically the collaboration. In the sense, the development team start creating their own containers and they start actually contributing in the library itself. And there is a process actually we followed. So when the, anybody is like want to contribute in the staff container library, we actually have a review process for that. Our team reviews that and then we merge the code into the staff container library source code. And that's how they are available for everybody else. And we wanted to make sure that like, you know, the staff containers are generic so that everybody can use it or extend it by using it as a base image as well. So the training is one of the thing, regular feedback. So on the quarterly basis, we actually reach out to team, the whole number of teams, and we get their feedbacks. Whether the, the pipeline is actually making sure that, you know, we wanted to make sure that the pipeline is fulfilling their requirements. And as Martin mentioned that, you know, our uh, customer satisfaction, which is CSAT score was really great, which is approximately 4.9 out of five, because, the teams were well trained. The the value addition was great for the team, and teams were able to execute, uh, you know, uh, the task by themselves. They were able to onboard uh, their uh, microservices easily onto the pipeline, and that's why uh, this is the approach basically we have followed. Yeah, I think also just to add a little bit more there, 
as I noted earlier, our team, one of the things our, our team was responsible for and still is, is helping educate and get teams into some of the newer technologies. We've, we're a large organization and uh, working very hard to do digital transformation, shift that, uh, move that ship, <laughs> turn it in a different direction. And part of that was, for example, the containers and step containers, we ran into a variety of teams who had not previously really engaged and used containers before. So this gave us the opportunity to then educate teams on uh, using containers. Some teams were, they were there, awesome, we can roll with it. Others, we just needed to educate them. But this was important for us. Not only did we do it for the pipeline, but we did it for the organization, they get at that. So we really want people, we're moving to container development. You get away from all of the VMs. We had a large legacy system and platforms that we've been migrating away from. So these were all other benefits we got. And then things like our documentation continued to get too how we trained uh, every time we'd go to the teams and talk we you know, we get that feedback and oh okay something wasn't we didn't do this well so that's when we talk about the technology we really had to also be open to the, what the customers were telling us and if they tell you no you know I, I always talk this it's a sales a key thing about sales is when somebody tells you no and you're trying to sell them something which I said this is a sales thing here we're trying to sell them on our pipeline we weren't mandated or anything like that uh, then, then they say no. Then you know, why are they saying no? You know, what is the behind that? It might be that uh, you know sometimes it's as simple as well. They already had a pipeline and we're taking away their job as they view it. And so you might have that. But other times it might be well, you're just going to create more work for me, or they just didn't understand. So we spent the time to talk to them, and that, that really also shaped in how we continue to talk with teams, get better at that, and improve it. Uh, what we did for our documentation, et cetera. We got some really good compliments about the documentation we had, which and unsolicited feedback from teams about just how much they appreciated something. And I don't know about you guys, but software, my experience is software engineers, of which I'm one, tend to be a very cynical bunch. And when you start getting unsolicited positive feedback, that, that was huge, told us we were on the right track. Thanks very much. So we have a question uh, related to your Kubernetes environment. Can you give us some hints about what's its relative size and how much, how, how do you, how does it scale out for you? How do you watch it? Those kind of things. Is that part of your team or is there some other organization that actually shepherds the cluster? So uh, this is part of our team. So the, um, the Kubernetes clusters, they are managed by the IT team. Basically they host the Kubernetes cluster. We are the users for the clusters. Uh, but uh, every, uh, like the namespace in the, in the Kubernetes clusters, we have like two namespace, two or three namespace, which is our, uh, and the allocation is like based on the uses. Uh, I, I can't tell you the right, uh, the data right now, like uh, whether it is we have got 500 GB or the CPU limits. I think we have done some calculations based on like how many uh, pipeline engines we can host on particular namespace. So that calculation uh, is not on top of my head right now, but yes, we did a calculation. Uh, the, the only thing which I can tell you is, the Jenkins home workspace, like which need uh, storage, that was less than 20 GB for each pipeline engine because we don't store any artifacts into Jenkins home. Every artifact which get built is usually goes into the artifactory or the Docker registry. The, the logging, we don't have the log rotation, a lot of log rotations and the storage into the Jenkins home. The logs are actually getting stored into Splunk. So these are kind of different small, small techniques. You can say we have used basically uh, to utilize the resources. So, so uh, yes, we don't use a lot of storage. Uh, as far as I remember right now, we have 14 or maximum like 15 pipeline engine or Jenkins running on one namespace with that. Yeah, I think I'll just add a little bit more there. So to what Ravi was saying, we, the, We'd have to go look, see what the number of CPU allocations, but as noted, we spin up those individual pipelines for teams. And so if we start pressing up against how many CPUs we're allocating, uh, the good thing is with the, the step containers and the agents that trigger the step, you know, help initiate those uh, step containers, those are all dynamic. They come and they go. So you just need it on demand. So the, the advantage to us has been therefore that we don't consume huge amounts the main masters have to stay there they're running uh, it's been interesting as we see with some of our solutions when they're kind of just idling away uh, if you were on a full CICD and something was being built every few seconds but we're not to that level so it hasn't been uh, egregious but if somebody's really curious we could find out a little bit more but we just work with our platform team if they really feel like we're pushing up against it uh, we have monitoring tools that they provide us as well uh, then we can always ask for more and they've been great to work with uh, we've been 
one of the teams as they came on, we've always been engaged with them very closely. And so they've been very supportive in helping us. Yeah, thanks, Mark. Thank you. So how do you test drive changes to Poet before they go into production? Or do you do you just rely on your unit tests in the Poet framework? What's what's your experience in terms of rolling out new capabilities into Poet? Uh, Larry, would you like to answer uh, on this? Sure, yeah. So yeah, so we do have a lot of unit tests. Um, we also have a lot of um, it's not part of this project, it's a separate project, but we have some integration tests that you know go through some pipelines and do full like builds and deploy like and make sure that the deploy succeeded and then you know make sure that the metrics end up in the database that everything worked out so we have we do have like internally a bigger integration test suite that we also run um and then yeah we try and be really um re like really try to be backward compatible so we really haven't introduced many breaking changes so far um just because once people have something in place, it's kind of you know harder to to change. And then the other thing is, you know, like Martin and Ravi have mentioned, it's like we focus a lot on on customer support and customer service. And so, um, you know, if if something doesn't end up breaking, we're usually in all the channels all their teams are in on Slack and can kind of respond quickly and take a look quickly. Um, but yeah, I think the unit tests have been helpful. The integration tests have been really helpful also. And then you know, the focus on not introducing you know breaking changes has been a big one. Thank you. Now, how are you handling Docker container component, component security concerns? Like somebody chose an outdated Docker image. They decided to build based on a, a Java version that is now six years old or something. Do you have systematic things or is that left to teams to decide how they deal with securing their own code? Yeah, it's, that's a great question. So generally right now, uh, there are T-Mobile guidelines. Uh, they are ever evolving. It's something that our security organization has been working hard to uh, uh, update to and get to. And, and we have certain things that there are requirements of certain scans they do want to run. Those scans, uh, and then there's actually uh, step containers we have where there's other logging and information that's supposed to say, hey, we ran these things, here's all the data. And so if somebody is doing those scans, uh, then that stuff is also being captured. That's per some of the T-Mobile uh, mandates. But we generally, it's not our job as we see it to be the uh, enforcer of that, though those post and pre and post steps can be a spot where those can be injected. Certainly there are some spots where if we really need to know what the pipelines are doing, we can provide some of that behind the scenes, capture it. Uh, but uh, we use this T-Mobile guidelines. Uh, look, we generally work from a perspective of, uh, trust, but maybe verify. Uh, and that's really what the security teams do and audits and things like that. If we saw something egregious, just because we're helping somebody, we might say, hey, look, yeah, this isn't good. Our own pipeline, our own containers, certainly those ones that we're showing the library of, uh, we'll go through scans, make sure they're adhering also to the appropriate uh, thing. So that's how that works is we really leave it to the teams to be the correct, <laughs> do the do the things they're supposed to do within T-Mobile guidelines. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. So are there, there was some illusion earlier, are there any substantial problems you found by choosing to use containers as the key element of your pipeline? You, you, it appears that you've represented something that's more powerful to my mind than a simple Jenkins execute some code in the pipeline. You're really using containers as the steps. Were there things where that you said, oh, but this thing, we can't do it that way. And if so, any insights that you gained from that? Larry, would you like to answer or should I go ahead? Um, I, I'm trying to think if there's anything. Well, I, I get, to, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say the one I could jump to. We talked briefly, we've touched on a couple times. I mean, Ravi mentioned the iOS and the Windows builds. Right. Um, the whole thing about the AW ECS2 uh, ability, those were really where we did have certain things where we've noticed uh, if somebody, if they didn't have maybe, uh, and Larry can jump in and correct me if I miss on something here, but some of the times uh, you're doing a Maven build and you had a lot of libraries that were being, you know, you just got this big Java build, all these libraries that need to come in. 
Uh, if you didn't have a lot of that stuff preloaded, depending on the network and things, you could run into some challenges with a lot of stuff, all the dependencies being rebuilt. Uh, and so there were some situations where we did do some work where we said, okay, there might be where we need a static VM or use the ECS. So that was AWS, our ability for those who didn't know, you know, ECS is just a way to kind of create a server and bring up what you need on it dynamically, which is awesome. We don't have quite that level of automation here. We have tools and things to do some of it, but look, uh, Amazon and Microsoft have put a lot of money into building those types of automations. So we looked at leveraging that. So where we needed somebody who needed a little bit more of that, having that cash available to them, we could spin that up, it would load up and then they could do what they needed. So those were at least one that I can think of where the containers get you a long ways, but once in a while we had a few challenges. And usually we can also work with teams to maybe revamp how they build their containers, set up some of maybe the dependencies ahead of time in their container. Yeah, that's a that's a great uh, example, uh, Martin. And I think I believe we we struggled almost like a month to solve this problem because the source code was huge, and then these libraries, which Martin talks about, the Maven libraries, uh, how to share them across. So we we actually go by uh, the AWS uh, and the EC, ECS, and we can spin that too from the pipeline engine. So we utilized that VM, uh, you know, to spin the agents, and that really helped us. Thank you. So one of the one of the questions that just came in recently was he had, the individual had arrived late and didn't see anything in terms of how you do checkouts and other artifact man management. Do you have sample Docker files that you are sharing online that represent steps of what you're doing? Uh, so how we do checkout so it's like it's a it's a jenkins pipeline library so the checkouts are done through the groovy uh, the plugin i think the git plugin uh, larry correct me if i'm wrong and then uh, the docker file which you are talking about um, the step containers uh, they are internal to t-mobile and uh, they have like certain t-mobile specific information so it's hard to share them but uh, we'll we'll internally check like you know how we can make it more generic for the outside people and we can share those containers as well. The step, for example, like you know if I go into the documentation and if you would like to see the different step containers uh, as a recipe, you can see how we are doing the Docker build basically. But then uh, you can use these examples if you would like to use. But specific the Docker containers we haven't shared across. Yeah. And that was something actually we just have been talking about over the last few weeks that when we look at what we put in open source, um, we felt like there were a few more instructions we could provide uh, and also uh, look to maybe bring, we, as Larry noted, we use the drone uh, we we borrowed the drone code. I mean, frankly, why build a whole new UI for managing uh, our containers? We did add a little nuance, which was we could have a set of, of We'll just take it in terms of a project with a bunch of repos in it. People could uh, then ask for a repo that where they want to put their step container. They could submit to us that they have one ready to go that they'd like to be added. And we kind of had a master list within another repo that would allow us to build that documentation uh, and with the links and all the information for those containers. So we talked about at least getting some of ours up there as examples. Um, but as Larry noted, if you had just a very basic container, a hello world container, try some of the parameter passing. I mean, in the end, uh, which the examples do show kind of how to do all that, uh, can also work for you uh, quite well. Thank yeah, you. and again, like the, the the public, like the public Maven container, the public Gradle container, like those all, you know, work fine. I mean, any containers you're doing, and and this is like a common approach, I think, too. Like I said before, like if I, you know, haven't tried the Google Cloud build containers, but I'm sure those would work, or um, you know, if you're using like Amazon the code build, like, you know, it's, it's, it's all the same approach, right? We're starting the container, running command in the container, so. Thank you, thanks very much. So, so monitoring is one of the questions that was just, just raised. Are there things that you have been doing for monitoring where you'd recommend, hey, others should consider this monitoring technique? And are there things where, that you've learned from your monitoring systems? Tell us a little bit more about what you monitor and why you monitor that. Uh, so uh, we have like different, uh, you know, tools we are using. Like one of them is uh, for the pipeline perspective, we are using Grafana, the InflexDB, which is uh, as part of container itself, like uh, the pipeline uh, high availability, uh, availability of the pipeline and different matrices about the, about the pipeline. So that's the Grafana we are using and uh, it's in a container, step container. And then apart from that, we have uh, AppDynamics uh, we are using. 
uh, uh, to check the traffic and you know the pipeline engine so we have uh, automation around where we keep hitting the the all the because we have like 28 or you know close to 30 uh, jenkins running in the kubernetes space and then and uh, so we keep hitting the urls and we get like you know 200 okay and then we uh, we put the this on the slack messages so we utilize that for slack messages when there is any problem or any like you know disk space uh, you know issues or url is not getting hit we usually get a message on the slack and the, the teams take care of that yeah and then we also have uh, our kubernetes platform is tied into splunk we're uh, big users of splunk here so we also have information and insights that are coming about some of the other container runs uh, we always are talking about uh, you know we've talked about how to expand it continue to do better you can always do better on your monitoring and, and those pieces but kind of those components are the ones that all come together to form up how we monitor and watch so there's information about how often our pipelines running uh, you know how many step containers things like that there's so there's that kind of information that's the grafana stuff ravi talked about uh, the app d gives us more of a good performance information about how things are running there a bit if familiar that's a third party third party product out there that our organization well t-mobile uses for monitoring uh, application performance things and then we have obviously the pure hardcore logging stuff that also can go that goes into our splunk systems Thank you. Thanks very, very much. I think I think we've settled most of the uh, most of the questions. I've got at least one more. This one, you are also welcome to say I refuse to answer. <laughs> the question is: Have there been mistakes you've made where you think other people should learn from your mistake? Sometimes we make mistakes. Okay, it, do not tell us anything that is super secret. But if there are things that you say, you know what, we made this mistake and nobody else should ever make that mistake because we learned a bunch by that terrible thing. So, uh, yeah, definitely I will start and then Martin and Larry can add it to that. So um, uh, it's been like eight years. I, you know, I've been working with Jenkins and I have made a lot of mistakes, actually. I made a mistake when I started using a lot of plugins in my Jenkins. My master's goes down and, I, you know, I'm just scared, like, you know, the next day what will happen and the teams will not able to use it. So over the period we have learned, like, you know, we should we should avoid using a lot and lot of plugins. So that that we learn and that's how this, um, and then don't use a lot of, lot of groovy code to extend your pipeline. And that's how this pipeline came in picture. And these are, this is part, like, you know, part of all the learnings we did so far and the, the birth of this, uh, uh, this beautiful pipeline and the architecture which we came up with. Thank yeah, you, Ravi. Yeah, I just, I'll just piggyback on what, Ravi is saying a little bit. I mean, look, all of this is the fruition of learning from our mistakes <laughs> uh, and where we could do things better and we could continue on. And I'm sure even on, you know, in, in this, we even, you know, had some spots uh, where we, we challenged ourselves. Uh, often for us, it was how we were engaging with the development teams or, or something like that. Uh, and so we're always checking. I mean, that idea of being honest about where were your issues. A biggest challenge and why this came about, uh, and Ravi kind of touched on it, I, I got frustrated because we wanted to be container based, but uh, some of the developers uh, in our team by default would just kind of go back to writing and extending the Jenkins code. And it's like, no, 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 this has got to all be abstracted. And it's a little bit harder concept if you've been working in just the pure Jenkins world. Uh, you know, you've got to kind of shift your mind around that. And so I was like, we need a reset. And I actually came across drone. I learned about drone. And I went to Larry and said, hey, check this out, Larry. Look at what this does. What if we go down this path? and it, it just rolled and I mean we actually got the initial core of this in two months we had running and people being able to start to use and then over another four five six months we then continued to just get the other enhancements in and things like that but uh, yeah so there's certainly even in some of the code and how we did things we're constantly challenging I would say even to date our you know our monitoring isn't quite as strong as we'd like it to be we'd like to dial that up a bit more but uh, you know again just learning from every pieces and those were just like I said, it's a culmination of a lot of our other, uh, you know, attempts and where we were and just to keep working on that idea of continuous improvement. Larry. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think Martin summarized really well. I think, yeah, the whole project is really like, you know, trying not to repeat the same mistakes. And I guess I got to tack on to Ravi's um, point about plugins. I mean, even with the shared library, you know, early on we ran into some problems where you know, we're trying to get the, the library running on different chicken instances that have different plugins installed and even plugins that we weren't using, you know, just there would be Java class path issues where one thing was using, you know, some version of some Java YAML library that another instance had a different version of it installed through different plugins, you know, and 
those ended up causing you know issues. Um, yeah, and I guess the other one is right is um, you know complex logic should be testable, right? Which is something we focused on a lot. I think you know someone made the point that well you can do all this in you know Jenkins file using Groovy, and that's true. But I don't know how many people are have tests for their Jenkins pipelines. Probably very few. Now it's very easy to test, and so you know, try to make things as easy to test as possible. Having that be a goal um, um, is, is important. Um, you know, I guess another thing is to have things documented. That was, again, a big focus. But, you know, whenever we had a new feature, we made sure that we had documents for it and, and um, you know, not, not have <laughs> things that were kind of hidden or, or secret, you know, and trying to be, be uh, have everything documented. Thank you very much. So Ravi, Martin, and Larry, thank you. Thank you for taking your time with us. We so appreciate it. Are there any concluding remarks you have? I think we've answered all the questions that were on my mind, the questions from our audience. Any specific things you'd like to do before we close our session? I don't know that I have any else really myself other than, you know, really appreciate the opportunity. Uh, we obviously we open source this. Our, because we did feel like, hey, let's let's see out in the wild. Let's see if this uh, has value for others out there and see what kind of feedback actually we're getting from the broader community uh, out there as well. So again, just really appreciate it. I know people's time is very valuable and really appreciate everybody uh, coming in and listening in on this. Yeah, Thank yeah thanks everyone. Yeah, thanks Mark. Thank you very much. I'm going to go ahead and end this. The recording will be after it's been processed. It will be posted and available on the YouTube channel for Jenkins. Thank you, everyone, for joining a Jenkins online meetup. Thanks a bunch. Thank you.